so many forces in our world today seek to divide and conquer. And I believe that interreligious studies is one place where we can work on friendship and understanding in a way that strengthens us against division and helps us all work together for a common good. Welcome. I'm Rabbi Laura Duhan Kaplan, Director of Interreligious Studies here at the Vancouver School of Theology. And I would like to give you a very small taste of what it might be like to study interreligious studies here at VST. I personally came to VST in 2007 to study spiritual direction. I was already an ordained rabbi, and the truth is that my denomination, the Jewish Renewal Movement, does offer a program in spiritual direction, but honestly as well, I wanted to meet some new people and make some new friends. At VST, I found myself learning in a different spiritual idiom and a different religious vocabulary. And I had to translate everything from those Christian concepts into the ones that were familiar to me and then translate back. For me, the experience of doing that was transformative. I grew intellectually, emotionally, and spiritually. And I learned to look at aspects of the spirit that I did not previously even have the vocabulary to recognize were there. So I hope that all of you during your time at VST will look into studying interreligious studies and have a similarly profound experience. This brief introduction is part of our series, The Theological 10%. As we begin to look at Oh, a fraction of the 10% of what there is to know about interreligious studies. We'll begin by just taking a look at where each of us are starting. Here are four possible starting points, all of them good and appropriate. You might be an exclusivist, someone who believes that your religious tradition and your religious community has received the correct revelation and has the right understanding of God and spirituality, and yet you might still be curious about what other people are practicing and studying and understanding in their cultural communities. You might be an inclusivist, someone who still believes that you personally, or you and your community have the correct revelation. Nonetheless, you also recognize that each tradition and community in its own way um, incorporates, touches upon, shares in at least part of this accurate spiritual insight and truth. You might be a universalist, that is, you believe that there is one truth about God, one truth about the Spirit, and yet there are many different vocabularies for speaking about it, for approaching it, for understanding it, for bringing ourselves into harmony with it. And you do not particularly believe that your tradition's language is the most pristine and the most accurate. And thus, you're interested in learning the different vocabularies. You might be a pluralist. That is, you have no particular attachment to, no particular view on who is right and who is wrong. You're not that interested in comparing who is better and who is sloppier. You don't have a unifying theory. You're just curious and ready to learn. So as we study together for the next 15 minutes or so, just reflect on yourself and keep in mind which of these perspectives seem to be most present to you. It's important information not only about your own spiritual orientation, but also about how you learn. 
we will be looking together at the opening paragraphs of the Tanakh, that is the Hebrew Bible, the New Testament, and the Quran, the Islamic scriptures. Each of these opening paragraphs of each of these very carefully edited and constructed documents, each opening paragraph gives you a little hint of the main points of that tradition's theology. And so as we read, I'm going to ask you to reflect on two things. First, what does each opening section presume exists? What does it presume is in place or has already happened? Second, what does each opening paragraph suggest about how God operates? In the world. Here is the opening paragraph of the Tanakh, Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. When God began to create heaven and earth, the earth being unformed and void, with darkness over the surface of the deep, and a wind from God sweeping over the water, God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, a first day. What exists? God exists. God has no backstory. God is just there acting. How does God operate in the world? God speaks. God appreciates. God names. God brings time into being. And you see, even in this opening paragraph, some of the main points of Jewish theology. There is one God who is infinite, who is the source of all. Who has created the universe. This God has no beginning, no location in time, and this God's word says it all, gives rise to all of reality, and as we later learn in our studies of Judaism, it may take us and our community, lifetimes upon lifetimes, to understand and grasp all the depth that is in this word. The opening paragraph of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1, yes, it is a genealogy, and perhaps if you're familiar with the Bible, perhaps your eyes glaze over when you read genealogies, but don't let that happen. Genealogies hold some of the most fascinating information. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac, the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah, the father of Peretz and Zerach, whose mother was Tamar, Peretz, the father of Chetzron, Chetzron, the father of Ram, Ram, the father of Aminadav, Aminadav, the father of Nachshon, Nachshon, the father of Salmon, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rachav, Boaz, the father of Ovid, whose mother was Ruth, Ovid, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Avia. Avia, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram. Jehoram, the father of Uziah. Uziah, the father of Yotam. Yotam, the father of Ahaz. Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Ammon. Ammon, the father of Josiah. And Josiah, the father of Yekonia and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. 
After the exile to Babylon, Yekoniah was the father of Shaaltiel, Shaaltiel the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel the father of Aviud, Aviud the father of Eliakim, Eliakim the father of Azor, Azor the father of Tzadok, Tzadok the father of Akim, Akim the father of Eliud, Eliud the father of Elazar, Elazar the father of Matan, Matan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Thus, there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. What does this text presume exists? All of Jewish history. There is a paternal line to the Messiah who is the result of all previous Jewish history, or the culmination of all previous Jewish history. There is a paternal line of heroes, and there is a maternal line of women who cross boundaries and take risks, because that's what it takes to create the kind of personality who will be coming forward as a special event in history. Also, a structure exists, 14 generations leading up to this moment. And a reader could be forgiven if they also read into this that a plan exists. How does God operate in the world according to this text? God operates in history and through human beings. And here we see some of the basics of Christian theology. A new revelation is coming, but it is building upon previous developments in Jewish religion and Jewish history. And there will be a divine figure who is also an embodied human being acting in history. The opening of the Quran. In the name of God, merciful to all, compassionate to each. Praise be to God, Lord of the worlds, merciful to all, compassionate to each, Lord of the day of judgment. It is you we worship, and upon you we call for help. Guide us to the straight path, the path of those upon whom your grace abounds, not those upon whom anger falls, not those who are lost. What exists? God exists, along with all of the worlds that God oversees. God's attributes exist, compassion and judgment, and a future event that is not yet visible to us also exists, the day of judgment, one of the many worlds and realities under God's watch. How does God operate? God gives us guidelines to follow. God is available to consult when we need help. And the experience of God is very, very real for those who experience grace or anger. And we do see in this brief paragraph some important points of Islamic theology. There is one God responsible for all creation, oversight, and world management. God's nature includes all of the divine capacities, from mercy and compassion to judgment. God has revealed to the prophet Muhammad the guidebook for human life. 
and God will judge with great compassion all of our efforts to live into the teachings and walk the right path for human beings. Which aspects of these texts felt comfortable to you or familiar? Which were surprising or provocative? That's also important information about the background knowledge that you bring with you. And it's wonderful information about your openness to the three texts and your ability to be moved by them. Obviously, I only highlighted a very few aspects of each text. Because really, this is the very first step on a journey. And I wish you well as you look at and explore what is unfolding for you on this path. I'd like to close with a brief advertisement for the Interreligious Studies Program. The Interreligious Studies Program reminds us that though VST is a Christian institution, students from many different traditions are welcome to study whatever is of interest to them within the VST curriculum. When we had first started the Interreligious Studies program, we had thought to focus on Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and indigenous traditions. But due to the complexity of our region, due to the growing network of contacts that BST has, and due to the interest of students and faculty, we also bring you teachings from Hindu, Buddhist, and Sikh traditions. We host the Commons Hour program, where guests from different spiritual traditions lead us in spiritual practice. Each May, we host a two and a half day intensive interreligious studies conference on a topic of contemporary concern in our society, such as religion and violence, encountering the other, spiritual perspectives on death and dying. And of course, we have a full program of core courses and elective courses during the regular term and during summer school. And we hope that you will make sure to pay attention to those when the course offerings for each term are published. I look forward to seeing more of you. Thank you.